Howdy folks! I mentioned in my last review how Back to the Future was a boring game. Well, like many of the other faults that I pointed out about that game, boring can be applied to pretty much every title in LJN's library. And that, to me, is the biggest problem LJN games have. They're dull as dirt. So, it's only fitting that I review a game that's more stimulating. So, I've chosen that age-old NES classic, Super Mario Brothers. What's cliche about it? This game is a lot more entertaining and stimulating than Back to the Future was. Well, I'm not you, Shasta, and the sooner you figure that out, the better off you'll be. Anyway, it's great that I finally get to talk about this game. I love the Mario franchise. It's ranked pretty damn high on my top video game series of all time. Now, as some of y'all already know, I do like Sonic games more, but that doesn't mean that I out and out don't care and or don't like Mario games. Far from it, in fact. I have a lot of fond memories of playing this and other Mario titles when I was a kid. This one here was actually the first Mario game that I ever played. As I mentioned before in a previous review, when I was a little kid, me and my family had two consoles, a Genesis and an NES. Now I usually had the Genesis to myself, but whenever one of my siblings, usually my sister, wasn't playing the NES, I was playing second player on one of our NES games. My brother and I played the shit out of Super Mario Brothers, and he's actually still better than I am at it today. So, like Sonic 1, Super Mario Brothers has a special nostalgic place in my heart as a gamer. So yeah, I love this game, and there's some good history I have with it. But what about the history behind this game, and how the franchise in general came to be? Shut up, Shasta! Now, it's true that Mario appeared in games prior to this one. Those included were a few arcade games, such as Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., which in that one he was actually portrayed as a villain, and of course, the original Mario Brothers. But in order to get a better understanding of Super Mario Brothers, we have to go back all the way to the year 1984. Ah yes, 1984. The video game industry was in dire straits during that year. Long story short, the industry was experiencing what has come to be known as the infamous video game crash of 1983 and 1984. There were many contributing factors to this event, but the two main reasons were an oversaturation of both hardware and software. The average consumer didn't know where to turn, so they just simply didn't buy anything video game related. Also, the general public started viewing video games as a fad, much like the pet rock. And like all fads, it was destined to fade away into the annals of cultural history. It seemed like the industry's fate was sealed. That was all until Nintendo hit the scene at the very end of 1984. It was like a phoenix rising from the ashes. A new dawn had come. The industry was practically on its deathbed. And had it not have been for Nintendo, video games, at least in some ways, would probably be a dead medium today. Before Nintendo officially launched their entertainment system, they had to first pick out a game from a list of 18 launch titles to use as a pack-in game for the console. Throughout the year of 1984, two Nintendo employees by the names of Shigeru Miyamoto and Takeshi Tezuka were developing a new platformer video game. Originally, Tezuka and Miyamoto were going to create an entirely new character from scratch for the game. However, Tezuka suggested that Mario should be put in as the main character. 
Miyamoto, who, by the way, was the creator of Mario and had worked on the three Mario games prior to Super Mario Bros., was ultimately delighted with the suggestion and took Tezuka's advice. During the early development of Super Mario Bros., Miyamoto and Tezuka decided to hire on arcade game developer Toshihiko Nakago as the game's main level designer. The levels themselves, before being implemented into the game, were first drawn on graph paper by either Miyamoto or Tezuka, and then handed over to Nakago to design and program into the game. It took a little over a year, but by 1985, the game was ready. During its test plays, Super Mario Bros. proved to be the most popular out of the 17 other titles that were to launch alongside the NES. The decision was clear, and Nintendo's president, Hiroshi Yamauchi, chose Super Mario Bros. to be the pack-in game for the NES's launch, ensuring that anyone who bought an NES would have Mario as their first game. If you own an NES, then there's a 99.9% .9 chance that this game is in your collection. And hell, even if you don't have an NES, you've probably played this on something else. But what has made this game so popular? Well, let's play it and find out. Alright, Super Mario Brothers. Here we go. Wow, would you look at that? Those are some very beautiful visuals. For the time that this game was released, those graphics were something to behold. Most games, before this one's release, looked more like this. And I'm not saying that these visuals are bad or anything, games like this were a product of their time, but Nintendo was trying to usher in a new generation. The graphics needed to look prettier in order to drive that fact home. When you look at it this way, if the visuals look the same as something like on the 2600 or the Intellivision, then people wouldn't have bought the NES. Nintendo was bringing something new to the table, and they had to show it. Another good point about this game is that it has a plot. And it was one of the first games to actually have a plot. Back in the day, video games, for the most part, didn't have stories. Devs back then just didn't consider them to be necessary for a game, and thus they usually never implemented one. But Nintendo was known for putting plots in their games. They did it with the original Donkey Kong game, and they did it with the original Mario Brothers, so it was only fitting that they gave their flagship game a plot. The story is very simple. In fact, it's so simple that it's been done before this game, and probably video games in general, were released. It's the damsel in distress story. Now don't worry folks, I'm not one of those weirdo SJWs who think that this particular trope is fact theft, but it has been done to death. Granted, for the time that Super Mario Bros. was being sold, the trope had not yet become overused. So, whatever. Anyway, the story for the game goes like this. One day, the peaceful Mushroom Kingdom, the country in which many of the Mario games take place, is invaded by a paramilitary force called the Koopa Troop. Led by the villainous yet charismatic King Bowser, the troops swarm over the kingdom and manage to kidnap Princess Peach. After Peach's abduction, the Koopa Troops start to terrorize the kingdom by turning its inhabitants into inanimate objects. Two local plumber brothers by the names of Mario and Luigi soon hear of the princess's plight, and they both set out on a mission to save Peach and thwart the evil Bowser and his Koopa troop. It's a pretty cool plot. Kinda weird, but still good. It's the typical fare of Knight takes on a dragon to save the girl scenario, but it works. Like many NES games that would follow, Super Mario Bros. is quite a challenging game, and not unfairly so. Oh sure, it gets harder and harder the further you go, but it's in increments rather than just BOOM, in your face, difficult. The game also gives you some leeway when tackling these levels. For instance, when you die, press A and start at the title screen to return to the world that you died on. Speaking of worlds, there are eight of them. And in each of the eight worlds, there are four levels, bringing us to a total of 32 levels in the entire game. More levels the merrier is what I say. It can be a bit of a long game if you choose that route, though. At the end of each world, you face off against a clone. That's right, I said clone. A Bowser. If you have the Fire Flower, then all you gotta do is just chuck some flames at him until he's dead. And here's where we're introduced to a character that I find to be pretty 
pretty annoying. I am, of course, talking about this little jerkball here, Toad. After completing seven of the eight worlds, you meet up with a Toad, one of the inhabitants of the Mushroom Kingdom. And his words to you are always, Thank you, Mario, but our princess is in another castle! Christ, does that get annoying. Also, is it me, or does it look like he's flipping you off? Shit, this is what Toad should look like. Yeah, that suits him more. Actually, you don't really have to endure much of Toad's annoyance. If you want to, you could just skip worlds altogether. Say you want to play and also beat the game a little more casually. Well, that option is available to you via secret warp pipes. Usually these pipes are hidden in underground levels. Finding them isn't too hard though. Just gotta get to the very top of the screen where the score and shit is. Walk along the level a little bit and you'll find the warp pipes. To me, that's a really cool option. If you're a casual gamer and or you're going for a speedrun, then the opportunity to get through the game quickly is there. Like many platformers, Super Mario Bros. has enemies to fight, or avoid in some cases. Most of these enemies have become staples in the Mario franchise. For example, you got the Goombas, the mushroom-shaped baddies, the piranha plants that like to hide in pipes, and of course you have the Koopas, the turtle enemies that come in different forms. But probably the most infamous form of the Koopas are the Hammer Brothers. I really don't like these guys, and that's me being nice. Fuck the Hammer Brothers. They are without a doubt one of the harder enemies that you'll face in this game. And they're unavoidable. Even if you're just casually playing or speedrunning this game, you'll inevitably come across these schmoes. Having the Fire Flower does help, but there's a pretty high chance that you'll end up losing that power-up by the time you reach the first set of Hammer Brothers. So yeah, I hate these guys. There are a few other enemies in the game too, like the Buzzy Beetles, the Cheap Cheeps, and the Bloopers. These bad guys would wind up in one way or another in numerous Mario titles, especially the Goombas and Koopas. You know, another good point about this game is the music. The music in Super Mario Bros. defines classic. In all, there are nine songs, and in the years that preceded this game, each one has been remade, remixed, and every other sort of reimagining you can think of, especially this song right here. The music in this game was written and arranged by this guy, Koji Kondo. Kondo wrote the music in such a way that the players would feel a greater sense of immersion whilst playing the game. And actually, it worked. The music in this game is really good, and it makes you feel like, hey, we're on a real adventure here. The music makes you feel immersed. And back in the day when the game came out, music for immersion's sake was a new concept. Typically, songs were added to games at the very end of their development. Not Super Mario Bros. Mr. Kondo was hired on when development first started on this game. The devs at Nintendo wanted the music to play an intricate part of Super Mario Bros. It was specifically written for the immersion. Well, folks... <clears throat> I think it's right about time to give this game its final grade, but before I do so, I want to share some of my final thoughts with you. Like any game, Super Mario Bros. does have a few faults. For instance, there is no save feature for this game. Meaning that if you're going to play this game all the way through, then you better be prepared to leave your NES on for a while. Unless you want to go the emulator route, the moment that you turn this game on is the moment that you're in it to win it. Another issue with this game, and this is me being more nitpicky than anything else, is that sometimes the ways in which you die can be really cheap, like stomping on a Koopa twice and then its shell knocking back and hitting you, thus losing a power up or straight up dying. And then there are the things that I've already mentioned, such as Toad being annoying and the fucking Hammer Brothers. But other than that, Super Mario Brothers still stands quite well today. It's a simple pick up and play game that's just simply fun. And that's probably why it's been re-released numerous times since its initial launch. 
such as its full 16-bit makeover in Super Mario All-Stars. Also, the game set some standards that are still alive today. A lot of games that were made after this owe at least one thing to this title. One of the standards that was made by this game is how video games are played now. Back in the day, you played a game for points. Today, you play them for the adventure. And so, I decided to give this game a G for good. This is where the Mario franchise really hit its stride, and it was a humble beginning. But there are some people that are a bit more meh with this game. So I asked my friend Dylan Tomasi for a second opinion. Hey Dylan, you ready to give your two cents on this game? Hello, it's me, Mario. Mario? Well, this is unexpected. I'm here to do review on my own game. It is the best. I jump on things and I go, oh wee! And then at the end I go, wee! And why do I do all this? Because of the princess. Because I love the princess. Because Koopa stole the princess. And I'm like, hey Koopa, I'm a plumber. Give me back the princess. Hey, who the hell are you? What the hell are you doing in my house? What? It's me, Mario. I'm doing my review of Super Mario. What? That's my review. What are you talking about? No, 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 no. This is my review. I'm Mario. Dude, get the fuck out of my house. You should go fuck yourself, because you're homo. I'm phoning the police. Fine, if you don't want me here to do the review, I'll leave. I don't need this crap. I'm motherfucking Mario. I'm important. Ah, uh -huh, bye-bye. Hooey! Jesus. Oh, wow. Anyway, hello, I'm d -Laps and never mind that. Anyway, I'm here to do a review for Super Mario. So, it's probably been about 20 years since I played the original Mario, and playing it again now, it holds up pretty damn well. And actually playing it with color is pretty cool too, because when I was younger, I only played it on Game Boy. I didn't actually own an NES until like the late 80s, early 90s, and Super Mario 3 is kind of my first introduction to the Mario thing with that. And playing it now, it is fun, but it is really repetitive. It's like doing the same shit over and over again. Like, I kind of got bored of this like really fast. And seeing where Mario is now compared to where he was, he's evolved so much that this game is like a bare bones version of Mario. It's kind of like Metal Gear Solid Phantom Pain. It looks photorealistic now, but then you go back to the 1987 version on the NES and you're going to play that and tell me you're going to have fun? Bullshit. You're going to play it for 20 minutes because it's a novelty item. It reminds you of something when you're young, but once you get bored of it, you'll move on to the new thing because you're a product of your own environment. And in my environment, I don't play too many side-scrollers anymore. And yes, overall, it does hold up very well for an old platform game, but this is still like too old for me to care. I hope that when Redneck wants to review the third Mario, he asks me to come back, because that one I think I'd have a lot more fun playing, because I played that one a lot more when I was younger, and I have a more of an opinion on it. For this one, I was just like, if there's nothing else to play, let's put that in, I guess. So overall, I'm going to have to give this, and I know probably people are going to give me the middle finger, but I'm going to give this a 4 out of 10. I know, I'm a fucking asshole, I'm sorry. But this is so fucking boring now. You really think this is fun? Like, I'm not dissing the people that like this shit. Uh, you know, that's cool for you. Because you have that, like, ability to play this stuff and keep going with it. Like, I have a buddy that played Dick Tracy on NES for literally, like, a month trying to beat it. And I scratch my head every day thinking, how the fuck can you endure that? How can you go through that? I don't understand. But some people have that ability. I don't. I, I play stuff that I find interesting. Mario, the first one, I don't find interesting. Part 2, eh, it's kind of a weird game. I'll play that. 3, I think is, uh, I hope I come back to 3. And even the new Mario, N64, I, I would love for, you know, have to talk about that one. But I'm sorry, uh, it's just my opinion. I know everyone thinks I'm a douche now, but you know what? If the shoe fits! <laughs> Thank you, Dlaps. Your opinions are always welcomed on my channel. And you folks don't forget to check him out. Guy is a fantastic reviewer.
Jessa, I noticed that you were pretty quiet for this episode. Do you have any opinions on Super Mario Brothers that you'd like to share with the viewers? Alrighty then, thank you for your opinions, Jazz. Anyway, needless to say, the game went on to be a huge success, and with said success, an inevitable sequel would be made. In fact, there are two games that bear the name Super Mario Bros. 2, but those are going to have to wait until either March or April, because now it's February, and that means it's time to kick off our first ever FPS month. So. I'll see you guys in the next review.